for like one more minute. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so you got you all want to go one at a time then is what you're suggesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And so we'll probably have like 15 minutes, and then we'll do a Q and A. Yeah. Sound good. After? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. <coughs> Aloha, Mike Kako. Aloha. 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 Let me try that again. Aloha, Mike Kako. Aloha. Okay, you can hear me. Awesome. Um, oh, David, Wahike, Kaleo, Humaile, Koino, Piha, O Vau, O Wahike, Maile. No Mauna Wili Mayao, um, Mahalanui Lo Yaoko, no Kahuyana, Kiava Kea, um, Aya Kako, Maluno, Komako, Aina Ea. Um, mahalo everyone for being here. I'm Wahike Maile. I'm an assistant professor of indigenous politics at the University of Toronto in the Department of Political Science and also an affiliate faculty member in the Center for Indigenous Studies at the St. George campus in Toronto. I am from Maunuwili here on Oahu Alua. I'm honored to be chairing today's panel and give special thanks to the program committee for sponsoring this panel. It's a very important panel in continuing our ongoing discussions about Aina, the land that which feeds us in relationship to the 30 meter telescope development project which seeks to destroy and desecrate our Aina here in Hawaii but also to center the voices of Haumana at the University of Hawaii who are on a front line against the 30 meter telescope at an educational institution that cares much less about Kanaka Oivi voices and much more so about the voices of $1.5 billion of backing and modern astronomers that supposedly have kinship to ancient Hawaiians. But what we know is that our culture is thriving and living in the present. And it is not just thriving and living at Pu'uhulu Hulu, at the base of Mauna Wakea, where the main blockade is formed, but it is also living and thriving at the University of Hawaii at Ma'anoa because of the efforts of students that you will hear from today. So I want to provide some brief remarks, just a few minutes to set the tone for this panel, and then introduce our esteemed panelists and hear from them because that's what you all came for. The front lines are everywhere. They're at Hunana Niho, they're at Kalai Loa where last night more Kia'i were arrested. I believe the number is close or beyond 200 now that have been fighting for the ex against the expansion of a wind farm at Kahuku. The front lines are also at Mauna Kea. They're at the University of Hawaii at Bachman Hall at Wise Field. Kia'i are everywhere, and we're fighting for our lives, our land, our more than human relatives, and our ea, our sovereign independence, and our ability to rise, and rise indeed we are. They're wahine, mahu, gender non-conforming, and LGBTQ, and kane, who are all putting their bodies on the line. The panelists are not just haumana, students. They are po'e, aloha aina, people who love their land, who love that which feeds them, and who love their country. They are our freedom fighters. I am honored to learn from them and to continue this fight with them for a decolonized then and deoccupied there, here in the Pai Aina of Hawaii. So with that being said, I'll introduce our panelists in the order in which they'll speak, and then I will give up the mic to them. First, you'll hear from Konoi Lani Pacheco, Konoi Lani is a kama of Makawao Maui and a graduate of Kekula Kaiao Puni or Kekau Like. She is currently a master's candidate at the College of Education, studying to be a Hawaiian language immersion teacher. She is a graduate research assistant under the Curriculum Studies Department, assisting with a new project called Aupuni Pala Pala, an effort in partnership with the Office of Hawaiian Education to create professional development opportunities that are designed to increase knowledge and implementation of Hawaiian values language, culture, and history within Hawaii public school classrooms. 
She is also a student teacher at Kekula Kayapuni O Pu O Hala, teaching seventh and eighth grade social studies. Her short term plans involve returning home to her high school alma mater on Maui upon graduating to teach. Her long term goals are to infiltrate, I love that word, to infiltrate the Hawaiian Department of Education and become a part of its administration to better the education system for Hawaii's future youth. Um, to Kanoi Lani's right, we have Hiva Ka'apuni. Hiva is an undergraduate student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, majoring in Hawaiian studies and political science. She has grown extremely passionate for the study of vai, or water, and the ways in which we can better protect Hawaii's sacred water sources, the most important being Mauna Kea. She is a member of Kia'i Ke Kahau Kani and has been involved in a number of political actions on campus which has allowed her, as well as many of her colleagues, the opportunity to stand in another kind of front line for our mauna. <laughs> to her right is Bruce Kaimi Watson. Oh, I mean Zion. Call him I. Zion Tamashiro, who is an engineering student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He's also occupying Bachman Hall that stands in solidarity with protecting Mauna Kea. He is passionate about science, but also holds scientific and research ethics in high regard in determining Pono science. <laughs> Next to Zion, last but not least, is Bruce Kaimi Watson, a doctoral candidate at the University of Hawaii in Educational Foundations. He often finds himself researching the history of education in Hawaii and is currently finishing his dissertation, which seeks to describe Kanaka Oivi educational philosophy relying upon modern Kanaka discussing Mo'olelo published in Hawaiian language newspapers. Aloha kako, uh, mahalo uahikea for that introduction. Um, so yeah, my presentation is primarily going to focus on Kia Ikaho Kani, its origins, um, kind of who we are, what we do, why we do it, um, some of our past action plans, and some of them that are currently happening now. So we started with this oli, um, Velina Manoa. Um, which was written by Dr. Kiawe Lopes, who is a Hawaiian language pr professor at Kauai Huelani, the Hawaiian language department at Manoa. Um, and it's kind of just an introduction, um, a welcoming to Manoa. Um, Velina Manoa welcomes to Manoa the lehu aloha, the place of abundance of love. Um, aloha ua tuahine, which is the rain of this valley. My Luahine from Luahine, which is a mountain in the back of the valley, all the way to Waikiki, which is Kai, which is the ocean. Um, Kia Ike Kahokani, guarded by the wind, Kahokani. Kani no na leo eo kama aina, you hear the voices and you feel welcomed. Aina aloha e, beloved, um, beloved aina, manoa e. Um, and I wanted to kind of start with this because this is one of the oli that we do at AHA. Um, that kind of differentiates our aha from the aha that's happening on Mauna Kea. And for those of you who don't know what aha means, it's um, our, I can't find the word in English, ceremony. ceremony. Yeah, um, <laughs> protocol. So um, this is one of the oli that we do. And this is actually where our hui or our student organized group got our name from, Kia'i Kahau Kani. Um, so na vai ke kuleana, whose responsibility is it? Where do we find our responsibility? Um, I think this is a question that a lot of us at Manoa think about because we're not necessarily from Hawaii Island um, and we can't be there because we're students at UH Manoa. Um, so finding our responsibility, 
finding our way, our Allah, to protect Mauna Kea um, from where we're at. And as students who benefit from a university who continues to perpetuate violence and desecration on our sacred island, um, on our sacred spaces on our islands, um, it is our kuleana to stand up where we are and to make our voices known and to hold our administrators accountable for their actions. Um, and I don't think there's any place better to do that than our campus. So um, where it all kind of started, um, November 1st, 2nd, 3rd-ish, I don't really remember the exact day, but it was early November that the proposed administrative rules got released for um, Mauna Kea. And these rules included things like um, you can't go up to the Mauna with 10 or more people. You can't use artificial light, which counts as a flashlight. You can't um, speak loudly, which is a direct um, attack at Kia'i who, you know, use their voice to pray. Um, you can't use blowhorns, anything like that. So it was eminent that these um, proposed rules were direct attacks at Kia'i um, and inhibiting us to move up to the mountain. So the next day, um, Andre Perez, Kahokahi Kanuha, and Ilima Long, who we, Kia'i Kahokani, and those at Bachman are in close contact with, um, decided to come and kind of hold an informative session um, for the general public to kind of share what these rules are, um, how to go about opposing them, you know, writing in testimonies. Um, and it was just a place for us to share Leo, share our aloha with each other. Um, and this is kind of the the origin of Kia'i Kahaukani, Ili Malong came up to me and Hiva and said, hey, do you guys want to be the face of the student organizers um, for Mauna Kea? And we're like, oh, okay, you know? Um, we're kind of thrown into it, but um, I'm glad she did that because it, it's created a space and a support group for so many other students to join and to get informed. Um, so this night, we ended up sleeping over. Um, there's just a few of us, and um, we planned out some action to do the next day. Um, and the next day was President David Lasner's UH System Reorganization Town Hall, in which administrators, faculty, professors, deans of colleges were invited. And um, we kind of took it upon ourselves to infiltrate this town hall. Um, we created signs that you know had the proposed rules, the number of the rule, um, and then the fine that it was attached that was attached to that rule and kind of did like a receipt list So if you only if you have a flashlight and if you're on the Mauna with more than 10 people you have to pay $7,500 um, So these were the ridiculous fines that were that were proposed in the rules and it one didn't cancel out the other and um, it's not like if you don't if, if you don't pay the fine then you go to jail like they'll take it out of your paycheck because it was a, a federal something I don't know the logistics of it but um, other signs included the number of people that were arrested on Mauna Kea and Haleakala um, and so we stormed in there we walked right in front of the big screen in the art auditorium where this town hall was being taken place and we were completely ignored for 40 minutes as President, President David Lasner stood right next to us and continued his speech in um, explaining his organization, his reorg for each department. And um, I was honestly taken back because I didn't think that the president of my school would ignore my existence as a human being. Um, but I'm not surprised. Um, yeah, so. We were ignored for maybe like 40 minutes. We stood there and he would move away from us to try to get out of the view because he was being live streamed and we just walked behind him with our posters and <laughs> kind of held them up. Um, and it wasn't until he opened the session for Q&A that um, professors and deans from colleges in the school kind of, you know, were like, are you going to address the elephant in the room and, you know, acknowledge these student, your student's existence? And his remark was kind of something along the lines like, yeah, I'm, I appreciate you guys for going about your protest in an obedient way. And I'm open to, I'm open to um, having communication in 
future planning of whatever. There was no follow-up. Um, so after this, we just kind of kind of tried to keep the pace and keep the pressure on him and keeping him accountable and, and making sure that he knew it wasn't a one-time thing. Like, we're not just going to show up at this town hall, um, but we're going to be on it at every event, at every time that we can be. So December 5th, 2018, was the UH press conference. And this included people across many different colleges, many different departments. Um, and this just was a space for us to share our statements of solidarity um, with those who are protecting Mauna Kea. And this was huge because this, I think, was the start of um, UH Manoa organization. Faculty from different departments coming together, talking to their colleagues, and trying to organize um, themselves. Um, I think before this, it was a lot of student-led action because faculty, professors, and deans maybe felt like their occupations were at risk. Um, but this was kind of that push through where we, um, we really started to come together as a, as a co whole college. March 13th was McCarthy Mall. This is a Ke'ikaho Kani organized event. Um, he was going to be in a lot of these pictures because she's kind of our spokesperson. But um, there was about 30 of us who stormed McCarthy Mall, which is a hugely traf trafficked area by student body. Um, we held up signs. We uh, passed out informational pamphlets. We were screen printing. <laughs> we were just you know, trying to make our presence. Um, and this turned out to be a really good event. Um, we also kind of did the same exact presentation that we're doing right now at the Lahui Hawaii Research Conference back in March. So just trying to, you know, be consistent with sharing our story and getting people involved. Um, May 11th, 2019, commencement, a bunch of us g gathered together and screen printed um, sashes that said Aole TMT. Um, and then I placed this on the podium knowing that David Lazar was going to speak right after me. So um, we just thought this would be a great opportunity, you know, that, okay, there's all of these, what you would deem successful, right? People graduating from, from college, whether, whether it be undergraduate, their master's degree, or their doctoral degree, and we're all wearing these sashes. Um, so it was very satisfying to, to one, see how many people um, you know, come out of this institution and who are in opposition of the TMT and who are not afraid to have their voice be heard. And then also to see David Lasner with the Aole TMT <laughs> right there. Um, we also frequent the Board of Regent testimony, um, the Board of Regent meetings um, and share testimonies. Um, the picture on the right is of a group of students on Maui, and the one on the left is the one of yesterday's um, Board of Regents meeting on Hilo. So not only are we out on campus, um, on our feet, protesting or protecting and advocating for Mauna Kea, but we're also doing it um, at the meetings as well. So trying to cover all bases. Um, July 12th to the 14th was the first Kahea. There was a bunch of us who kind of organized and went up there um, those first few days. Um, and I think that's what made it real for everyone, is being there. Um, it's easy to organize and to, to try to advocate for Mauna Kea from a far place, you know, just because, like, okay, this is all I can do, you know, um, from this place. But actually being on Mauna Kea kind of grounded us, I felt, and made us reevaluate our, our focus and our voice and um, how we wanted to go about things on, upon returning to um, Oahu. A bunch of us went to um, study abroad the day that the kupuna were arrested. So we were at the airport watching the kupuna be arrested, and we were bawling and being hysterical. But um, we later realized that our kuleana was somewhere else, and that was to share our voices with the rest of the world. Um, and we did that, and we knew that Mauna Kea would be held down. Um, and then Mauna Kea Kuhaoi Kamalie. So there's a, a bunch of um, students from Manoa who currently live on Mauna Kea who are taking classes online, who are flying back and forth. Um, 
there are a bunch of us who visit. There's a bunch of us who teach classes there. So, you know, just trying to be involved in in every way, every avenue that we can just to to strengthen the movement. Um, our most recent, re sorry, recent action plan was um, in late August. We um, we wanted to commemorate the 38 kupuna who were arrested on the Mauna um, in July. So we wanted to create 38 lele for each of the kupuna. And um, at first it was you know, something that we thought we couldn't finish because there was just a handful of us. But we pulled together, and um, it's now it's, it has its home at Bachman. Um, we also created signs. Um, this is kind of the day of our, our mobilization. This is the first day of school. Um, so yeah, we have the painted names of each kupuna and the lele that we created. So how many more in the name of research? Um, how many more people need to be arrested? How many more sacred sites need to be desecrated? How many more people need to be ignored? Um, and then the, the story behind the Hawaiian place of learning is um, David Lasner, I think early last year, kind of sent out an email that he wants to indigenize the University of Hawaii and that he deems it a Hawaiian place of learning. So we kind of just did a little play on words um, and decided to call it a Hawaiian place of earning. Um, so this, this day was amazing. It, it really showed how much, it showed the growth in students who are willing to speak up, who are willing to organize, who are willing to show up, who are willing to help um, make a presence. And behind this, um, I think behind this, how many more in the name of research is like a welcome to back to school poster. <laughs> so um, it was a perfect opportunity for us to display our sign. Um, and this is also the same day that um, a group of Kia'i, a group of Haumana decided to Occupy Bachman Hall and Kaimi Watson is going to talk. Kaimi and Zion are going to talk about that a little bit more, but I just wanted to put that in there. Um, that this was also the day that they um, made that commitment. So present day, um, Kia'i Kahokani participated in that um, majority march last month. Um, we hold aha or ceremony three times a day at Bachman Lawn. And the significance of Bachman Lawn is that it is directly in front of Bachman Hall, which is the office of the Board of Regents, so the, the decision makers. It's also David Lasner's office. So um, we strategically decided to place the lele there, and that's where the Ahu of Mauna Kea was um, erected in 2015. So we have AHA there three times a day, 8 o'clock, 12 noon, and 5.30, I believe. Um, and we... Um, we invite newcomers every day, um, and it's an amazing opportunity for us to kind of refocus, um, especially in the craziness that college is. Um, we also hold events at Campus Center. We do screen printing. We do um, kind of information pamphlets. We do um, testimony workshops testimony writing workshops. Kumu Snowbird Bento um, is at Bachman Lawn every Sunday, teaching hula and oli. Um, and some of us just recently participated in a play called Aua Ia, in which there was a huge section on um, Hawaiian activism and organization and protests against um, the 30 meter telescope. So with this, I just want to um, mahalo you guys for listening. and. Um, when we are done with aha every day, we say ah lele valeaku. So we do a multitude of pule, oli, mele, sometimes we do hula, and at the end we say lele valeaku, and that just basically means that our prayers are lifted up to Mauna Kea. So, e lele valeaku. Mahalo.
There's like this super weird thing that the UH has made us do where we have to log in through two different devices just to get into all of our stuff and I think it's ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> bear with me. No kamona kia, o hua e kamona kia, o wa kia ke kane o papa wali nu kawahi ne. Ha no ho ho ku he wahi ne, ha no ha loa he ali ne, ha no kamona he keiki mauna na ke. Belina me ke aloha kakoa pau. Let's see you say aloha. Um, Ova o Hiva Kaapuni no Pi Honua i Hilo, Makamoko Puni o Hawaii. Aloha, my name is Hiva Kaapuni. I am from Pi Honua in Hilo on the island of Hawaii. Um, as Oaiakea said, I'm an uh, undergraduate senior in uh, political science and Hawaiian studies. I'm intended to graduate this coming spring, 2020, so home stretch. Um, Mahalo to the American Studies Association and Wahikea for inviting us to be here and speak on our experiences with Mauna Kea and as Haumana at the university. Um, the chant I did for all of us just now is the Koihonua or the genealogical chant for Mauna Kea, which recognizes um, Papa and Wakea, two very important deities who can be loosely understood as Earth Mother and Sky Father. Um, and it recognizes the mountain as um, their child. It also recognizes uh, Ho'ohoku Kalani, their daughter, and Haloa, their son, who was born, stillborn and buried into the ground from which planted the first kalo that sustains us Hawaiians and everyone in Hawaii to this very day. Um, and sometime way later, around 77 or 76 generations later, came us. And from this same genealogical chant came me. So why did I start with this oli? Um, Hawaiians love to begin everything with genealogy, whether it's a story or a song or a chant or even a hula or if you're just at a party somewhere and someone comes up to you and says, oh my gosh, who's your mom, who's your dad, who's your uncle, where are you from? Because you look so familiar and I think we're connected somehow. Um, that's all part of our love for knowing where we come from and knowing who we come from. And that connection, um, that familial connection is what entails our kuleana to each other and to this land that we live on and that feeds us and to ourselves. Um, so kuleana being responsibility, you know, what kind of responsibility do you have to your ohana or your family or your elders and simply stated to feed, to take care of and to protect. So when we chant this oli and when we say he keiki mauna na kea, um, we are recognizing more than just the mountain as a descendant of Wakea, but really all of us Hawaii, all of us Hawaiians as descendants of Wakea and the Mauna herself. Um, and in chanting this and really in just knowing this, we are grounding ourselves in that familial connection and in that kuleana, that responsibility that compels us to do whatever it is we have to do to take care to feed and to protect. So I think when people see us getting arrested, bodies face down on the access road, or when they see us holding two to three hour ceremony three times a day, every day, rain or shine, 
or when they see us refusing to move and refusing to give up, that's not a choice because it's our responsibility that's grounded in that familial connection we have to this mountain, to the aina that we live on, and really to each other. Um, and that's our kuleana to our elders, from the ones sitting in the front lines up at Pu'uhuluhulu to the ones that, to the very one that they are sitting in front of. Um, and I think for a lot of people, this, this kuleana that I talk about kind of comes to them as a choice. Um, and choosing to stand or not um, comes as a choice because not everyone may understand why we do what we do. But then for a lot of those people who may not know where their place is in this movement or who may not know how to approach direct action or mass protest or even ceremony or Hawaii's political history or culture at all, there is still something in all of us that urges us to show up. And aside from some genealogical pool or maybe just the hype of it all, I really believe that it's the truth. And it's truth that somehow internally or subconsciously subconsciously guides so many people just to visit Mauna Kea, just to know and just to feel what it's like to be standing for what is right, or just to witness what it looks like to stand for what is pono, um, for a land, for water, for a people, for a nation, for a kingdom, and for this Mauna. Um, so Kanoi kind of had it in her um, PowerPoint, the very first day of action, which I think was three or four days after we were actually called to hold space at Pu'uhuluhulu, um, like 3,000 plus people just showed up. And we had kupuna who were ready, um, bundled up like 30 plus kupuna, bundled up in blankets, sitting on beach chairs in the middle of the road. And there were some of us, um, Kanoi was a legal observer that day, um, which also is a lot of kuleana. But there are so many of us, some colleagues, some people I didn't even know, some from any ge every generation that stood behind that line of kupuna, um, ready to support them in any way that we could, and getting ready to have been arrested if that's what it meant um, to support them, and if that's what it meant to support this movement, really. But, um, and we stood there from about 4, maybe 3.30 a.m. And as the sun rose, you know, like, so too did our people. Because, like I said, 3,000 or maybe four or 5,000, I couldn't really tell, the faces were just brought into the light and just surrounded us, ready to, like, support or give whatever they could just because they knew that this is what was right. Whether you've ever been to Mauna Kea before that or not, whether you were from Big Island or not, whether you were Hawaiian or not, you showed up because something told you that these kupuna and these people who are up at Mauna Kea and these 11 who are chained to the cattle guard and all of these people who are sacrificing a lot to be there and to protect this mountain is doing what was right. And what they were doing something that was pono, something just, whatever you want to call it, righteousness, integrity, humanity, truth. It's what led all of those people to just go. And I knew a lot of people that I kind of just saw around and people that I would have never thought would show up to some mass protest um, or to uh, political action or who may not even be involved in politics or anything to do with Mauna Kea at all. They just showed up because something told them that they needed to be there. And at that point, it's showing up was no longer a choice, like I had said. Um, it was really kuleana and simply said it's just the responsibility that we all hold to do what's right and to do what's pono. And that's really how simple this whole issue is, is to just do what's right. And 
so many people know that they're in the wrong, but refuse to hold accountability, um, which is why we continue to do what we do. So on July 16th, July 16th, I believe, when 38 Kupuna were arrested, um, one of them was my mama. My mom, who I, like Kanoi had mentioned also, watched through a live stream get carried away down the access road. Um, and although very sad, nothing showed more power and showed more clarity for me to understand that this is really just what it takes. If getting arrested, blocking the road, occupying weird spaces, just raising hell within different institutions that seek to silence us, it's just what it takes. And that's where our kuleana comes from. And that's why we're so, we just give so much to this issue because we know that it's, it's more than just fighting for Mauna Kea to stop being desecrated. It's fighting for who we are as a people. It's fighting for um, the acknowledgement of illegal occupation in Hawaii. It's fighting for um, our existence as Hawaiians and our right to um, our right to live and be here and govern our own spaces. So then what does that all mean for me as a student being away from home at the very university that not only condones the continued desecration of Mauna Awakea, but the incarceration and perpetual violence um, that is portrayed on Hawaii, on Hawaiians, um, but also facilitates it in the name of research. Um, like Kanoi also explains really well, it to me, it just means to continue to apply pressure against people like the B BOR, um, against David Lasner, against the hierarchy at the university, um, to continue to hold and create spaces where we can educate others, um, where we can hold ceremony, where we can raise our voices as a Lahui, and where we can collectively nurture this kuleana that we all have within ourselves. Um, and that we all have to this aina, to our kupuna, to the generations to come, and to Mauna Awakea. Mahalo. I'm sorry, I did not prepare a PowerPoint like the rest of the panelists here, but I'm gonna do my best. So my name is Zion Tamashiro. Just like Kiva, I'm actually from Hilo too. And for, so I, I'm taking a different approach from not from the culture aspects. Like, um, let me start off with it, saying is I love science in general. I'm an engineering student that has a very broad range of these scientific classes going from chemistry, physics, mathematics. And like and I now let me just set the groundwork. So this past summer I was I had the great opportunity to be a part of the to be an intern for the Pacific Internship Program for Exploring Science. And as we know it's like the acronym it's called PIPES. And the one thing that we were able to learn from like these sciences and oh <laughs> Call them my sorry. Yeah. So I was able to learn these sciences. Like my specific project was in geology, it's something crazy outside of my own field of study. And I, I, but I was just passionate to learn. I eat that stuff up. I love it. But out of, out of all the things that we learned during my, in, or what I learned during my internship, the one thing that always stuck with me, like out of everything, was scientific and research ethics. Like, what does it mean to have proper ethical science, pono science? So, so a lot of these, the UH, they kind of implement, it's actually a PDF that the UH system uses that a lot of the faculty and students use that deems for scientific and research standards for ethics. So they call it kulana no'i, which is the idea of building long-term relationships between your community and the researcher. and 
it goes on to saying about like pillars of what it means to have these standards. Standards like accountability, reciprocity between your community and the researcher, like access of knowledge when you have this kind of science. And, the, and there's many more different pillars to these. And I learned that in the UH system. And, I, and, and the whole idea is that when like being a scientist, like especially in earth sciences, the intentionality of what you want it should not be monetary value versus and or oh, excuse me notoriety for any of your research. The idea is that you're actually having like you actually want to do good science. You actually want to make a difference for your people, like so for the community community in general, and like to be honest like the first like during it was during orientation that I was learning these scientific ethics and I didn't like keep that in my mind because I just wanted to get straight to the science because that like it, it sounded really cool but it happened in July 12th to the 14th when the Monica movement started happening again and then it clicked it's the realization of what happens when you don't like hold these ethics to these like to your standards to what, what happens if like for example TMT the only example how if you look at like if they followed any of these scientific pillars any of these things that deem ethical and then you start crossing it off any reciprocity between the community any responsibility any communication access of knowledge you look at it and then you see that there's a big backlash of what happens when you don't communicate between your community and and that's why we're holding or Kiaike Kaokani is holding the university in like um, sorry blanking but they're, you're holding, accountable, holding the university accountable. Because in the end, by like, supporting the TMT, you're supporting unethical science. And, when you're, and in their vision statement, it says that there want to be a community serving, a community serving university under a Hawaiian place of learning to Malama Hawaii for the future generations. That is their vision statement that they want for the UH Manoa. How ironic is that? <laughs> Like they're they're telling us that they're that like they, they want to do all of these things for the community, but at the same time they arrest our kapuna, who they deem that they want to serve, that they say they're gonna serve, and so for the so I, like during Hilo that's when I was learning all this science and I came to UH Manoa to finish my engineering degree, and then of course we have like K K holding Bachman Hall and doing a lot of other of these events, and then. Realizing as I started to go and hold space at Bachman Hall more and more that the administration just does not care about us. That our voices are always silent. How many times I sat inside Bachman Hall, they just passed us like we don't exist. It's just the idea that it's the power structure. Somehow they have this like mentality of an idea that because they're already established, they have jobs already, and that us as students, we're still trying to figure it out that there's, there's this superiority complex. Like, what, what is wrong, <laughs> what is up with that? And so currently, right now, like at this very moment, the students of Bachman Hall is holding space and are gonna be locked in for the weekends because the, cause the administration holds their documents more important to their own public safety of their students. And that's so heartbreaking. How can, a, how can we put our education in the trust of these administration, but they can't trust us as students. And so we're currently on 75 days right now, holding space in Bachman Hall, or since the beginning of school. And you know, we've been, we've been having these back and forths with the administration and trying to figure out, like to actually build, we, like we really do wanna build relationships with these administration. Because event, we have to coexist together. But it just, it seems that, to be straightforward, they don't want that. And we're continuously trying to fight for it, to, hear, to let them hear our voices, to go into these meetings to find resolve or to, to resolve any conflict of issues. So, and I just wanted to, uh, I guess, so sorry, I'm trying to, Planned out. So going, so and like, sorry. After the seventy-five days of these issues, 
three of the students from Bachman Hall, including myself, had to fly all the way to Hilo on Wednesday just to get a meeting with the Board of Regents. On the first day of school, Kiai Kikahokani sent a, meet, sent a letter to the Board of Regents to actually have some meetings so that we can deliberate and to talk about the position that they stand for. Not just about the ethical science, but the culture and tradition, because that's most important to us as Hawaiians. The scientific ethics is the, 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 science, the science is the secondary parts of it. But imagine that. You have to, 75 days of not hearing from your administration or your board of regents, you, students has to miss, miss class, fly all the way to Hilo, wait seven hours for the board of regents to actually hear us. Finally, we give a testimony. A Couple hours later, they just tell the resolution, oh yeah, we approve it. And that's why we're continuously, continuously holding the university in accountability because they're, they're, they're failing us. They're failing our students. They're failing our faculty. The underlying racism that's going on on our campus. And I, like, that's why we're standing for just for, for not just for Mauna Kea, which is the main reason, but to fight for our future generations so they don't have to, have to hold for this, go on with this. So I'm sorry, that, that's just my stance, but mahalo. Hey. Aloha, everybody. So I'm Bruce Kalimi Watson, and I got to start that I'm obviously significantly older than the rest of the students here. Um, and so that's going to, like I go, every good talk should start with positionality. So what I want everyone to do is say the word OEV. OEV. So in my work and in my research, I, and I, in my, how I refer to myself, there's like you hear Kanaka, Maoli, or Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian, capital N, baby N Hawaiian. Um, I see myself as Kanaka Oivi. And I love the word Oivi because it begins with an Okina, the O, and then a uh, Kahako over it. And that is like the bound morpheme ish, like reddish, heavy ish, light ish. And then Evi means ancestor of bone. So when I use the word kanako evi, I remind myself every time that I'm a human being, yes, but I'm o evi. That I'm not an ancestor yet, but I'm ancestor-ish. I'm an ancestor in training. Because after I die, I will melt and become part of the aina, be part, become part of the evi that is around us, including Mauna Awakea. So in that, is that is my kulana, that is my position in the universe at this time, is that I have children the same age as them, and I'm not old enough to be on the kupuna line up on Mauna Kea, but I'm in the space in between that just makes sure that everything goes smoothly yeah, um, as we're going along. And then like they said, that there's different cultural issues, science issues. Mauna Kea is a very big place. And so there are a lot of issues that are all happening simultaneously. Water issues, geology issues, uh, bug issues, what are entomology issues. There are plant issues and ecological issues, environmental issues. Um, the part that I think is the easiest argument is just the community issues. Um, no 80-year-old grandma wants to spend her day in the middle of a road getting arrested. No grandchild wants to see their grandmother get arrested. No policeman wants to go home and when their, their child asks, what'd you do today at work, daddy? I arrested an 80-year-old grandma. This project is ripping our community apart. And as Oivi, not Kupuna yet, not Evie yet, and not an OPO anymore. I'm in this space between trying to figure out what to do. Um, I just have, I think of like Tuskegee and syphilis, of Micronesia and nuclear fallout. And I see Auntie Pua Kanaka Ole, who is like the chant mommy of them all for hula and teaching us chants, getting arrested. And although different, all of them are forms of violence. 
and it's where do I stand in this violence. So again, I see myself as OEV. Now the other word, I want everyone to say the word opio, because I use that word today. Everybody, opio. So O again is like that ish, but peel is the bottom in a stratification of power. So it be the prey and not the predator is a peel. So in that idea of OEV, that is not quite an ancestor, but an ancestor in training, that I know that opio, those that are younger than me, are not in a space that I'm in yet. And that I have a kuleana to them to make sure that they're not peel, <laughs> to make sure that they're not become, they don't become prey. So somewhere in that space is where I, I currently navigate. So I want to explain that. Um, and just kind of add on to what everyone else is saying. Um, wow, see, okay, so I'm a teacher. Just I've taught everyone from preschool to now I teach undergrad, so that's just my nature. Um, so then uh, with this panel, I was thinking, like, what is my position then at UH? As not quite OPO, not, by, uh, not quite kupuna. But I was blessed or cursed with the name Kaimi. And Kaimi, or to Imi something, is to search, which is possibly why I'm still in school at 45 years old, um, <laughs> because I'm perpetually searching. But what's cool is the definition of patriotism in a dictionary that was published a long, long time ago. Um, the word for patriotism is to imiana ikapono ke aupuni. So to perpetually search for what is right or what is just for your space. So um, with that, I see myself again um, at the university as this patriot named Kaimi that's looking out for Opio, that is OEV, and looking for what is pono perpetually for my place of being. Um, I've spent years teaching um, in a battle to be indigenous in settler spaces because um, learning institutions don't quite like um, the dangerous indigeneity that I seem to represent. So, oh, education, that's a beautiful thing. Um, but in this current space and why I'm here now back in school and in this space is because I'm just tired. I'm tired um, of prayers being seen as performance. Um, I'm tired of school and government officials doing their best to ensure that those prayers go unanswered. Um, and they, but they continue to profit off each ceremony. Every hula I dance from Mauna Kea is sold at a luau. Um, and although claiming to be a model indigenous serving institution, which I love, because somehow they just want the indige indigenous people to be servants. I go, we've served you coffee, we've served you sugar, we've served, we've served you pineapples. But this model indigenous serving institution, the university I currently attend has called for a militarized police force to in uh, arrest indigenous family members, protecting a mountain, like she said, is family to all of us. Um, on the first day of school this semester, oh wait, let me go back. Okay, how much time I have? Go, okay, what happened is, so they started with 2018. I'm a little bit older, shh, don't tell anybody. But in 2015, um, when the first arrest of Mauna Kea happened, some of the people that were getting arrested were my classmates, some people I grew up with. Um, people I spent time with um, becoming dangerous indigenous, uh, indigenous people. So um, they got arrested, they told me, come up now. Um, so I flew up the next day, this is 2015, and someone I just met asked me to jump in the back of the truck because we're gonna go to Wayo, to the lake up there, and to the proposed construction site. This would be the second time that I went to the summit of Mauna, uh, Mauna Kea. The first time I went was because I was a graduate student majoring in science. So I have like a physics, chemistry, anatomy kind of background along with a philosophical background, but my bachelor's degree is in Mandarin. I told you, my name is Kaimi, it's a curse. Um, so I went up with the only um, Kanaka astronomer at the time, astrophysicist at the time, Paul Coleman. So he took me up there to show me around and show me all the different pool and to kind of wow me to get into this field. Um, and although I saw the beauty of 
I got to be inside the observatories. I got to see and talk to astronomers and do some cool physics things. Um, it already existed and it was there, but I saw that the place was special. Um, and then, so when the TMT was being proposed back in 2014, 2013, when these first things, I was testifying as much as I could against it as someone who knew physics, but also someone that knows Hawaiian language, history, and culture. And I think the current conversations that we have at the university is, I told um, one of the astrophysicists, I go, I'm pretty sure that I have a better knowledge of optics, physics, engineering, than you do of Hawaiian language history, language, and culture. So if you grow your ike, your knowledge in that portion, while your physics is much stronger than mine, we can somehow find the balanced conversation. Unfortunately, that has not happened yet um, due to uh, people be unwilling. Anyway, so I get into the back of a truck of people that I've never met before. The day after the rest, they take me to the top. And this boy that I never met before turns to me and says, do you know anybody from Honolulu? And I go, I'm from Honolulu. He's all, uh, this rock says that it wants to go to Oahu. And we have this whole thing about not moving rocks. I don't know if you know that much about like Hawaiian culture, but it's kind of not like the deal. Um, but this boy asked me, and that, this, the proposed construction site, and he asked me, can you take this rock home? Um, he felt OK. Um, and it felt OK. Uh, so that rock, and it was only this one rock, decided to jump into his arms, into my hands, because he could have asked anybody in that truck. I was the only one from Honolulu, and he only asked me. He turned to me first. Um, that rock, as we came down, um, the call was put out that they're going to build this, the stone structure, the ahu, on Wai's field. So the rock knew what was going on before the people knew that the ahu were going to be built. And somehow, that rock came to me to get to UH. And that rock currently sits at the top of the ahu on Weiss Field. So that's why it is in Bachman, and it's in front of the, the toxic peak of the university where bad decisions are made. Um, but it is a direct line from the proposed construction site to Oahu for people that want to pray and to add their power to it. Um, so again, where my position is as OEV, as not quite kupuna, and not opio. Um, so that was it, and now that, that rock sits on the top of the ahu. So I have a kuleana to this rock. So throughout, since 2015, since it was built, I visit it um, to make sure everything's okay. And then on the first day of school, there was protocol happening at the Ahu. And some students decided that they were going to go inside. And they're going to stay in Bachman Hall. So as Makua, I wanted to make sure that those kids were OK. At the same time, I wanted to make sure that the Pohaku and the Ahu was going to be all right. And um, I spent time to build capacity, or helping the students build capacity in their ability to um, participate in the protocols, the ones that are staying over so it can be maintained over the weekends. Um, so again, that EV, Pohaku, is at the rock. I am OV, OEV, but that is kind of my connection to everything. And then what I want everyone else also to um, know is the mission and the vision of the university as stated. Just because um, I've said in a meeting with the administration, um, vegans don't work at McDonald's. And if you work at the convention center, you have a certain mission. If you work at McDonald's, you have a certain mission. That all our decisions should be guided and informed by that mission and that vision. So the mission is a ma lama lama e ko ma lama. And again, politics of translation. But they translate it as cultivating the potential within each member of our community. Located in the most diverse community and environment in the world, the University of Hawaii at Mano is a globally recognized center of learning and research with a kuleana to serve the people of Hawaii and our neighbors in the Pacific and Asia. We cultivate creative and innovative leaders who malama our people, it's the idea of taking care of, malama our people, our places, and our ways of knowing in order to sustain and transform our islands and the world. The vision is kalamaku o ke aloha aina, 
a leading light of Aloha Aina for Hawaii and the world. We will be locally and globally recognized as a premier student-centered Carnegie, Carnegie Research One community-serving university grounded in a Hawaiian place of learning that summons our rich knowledge systems to help Malama Hawaii and the world for future generations. That key point that community serving uh, university is a part that I think is, is home. And that is the part that is regardless of what you think about culture, regardless of what you think about science, about water, about rocks, about bugs, about plants, the community is being torn apart. And for a university not to press pause, to not say, you know what, let's stop, let's think about this a little bit further, is I think that is the biggest desecration. That is repeating the past wrongs of ivory towers that experiment on people of a certain color to benefit people of a different. And I think that's the part that is the easiest and the most solid argument is to that idea of a grandchild seeing their grandmother get arrested. And for me, for watching family members have to stay in 30 degree weather, it's not fun. Like in these kids that are saying in Bachman, I don't stay overnight, because again, I'm a core status. I go, I'm neither kupuna nor opio. So I go, if you guys are gonna lock in, that's what you guys are gonna do and make sure that you're okay. I'm just here to make sure that you're healthy and well. But um, it's not fun but it's obviously ripping our community apart. And that's uh, the, the drawing for the, that's on the cover of our brochures or our pamphlets. Um, it has the police and it has the uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources. What it doesn't have is the University of Hawaii. And that, if the university said no, if the university said pause, all the other research institutions would have to follow suit. So all we ask is for a pause. Because the beautiful thing about Hawaii too is this idea of poly -rhetoric, rhetoric and multiple truths. That if you ask a Hawaiian how was the islands formed, they say Papa and Wakea and they had babies. And you will say that Pele birthed the islands. And you will say that Maui fished them up. And which one of those is true and which one is false? All of them are true. All of them are true, but some resonate more in your body than others. So with that idea of poly rhetoric and that acceptance of that, all I ask is for us to get pause in order to hear the different perspectives and find out what resonates. Because right now my community is suffering because of a decision made possibly in 2013 and it was a bad decision that has rolled down here into this giant snowball. And I understand that there's two choices. It's either the university is getting hit by the snowball because the promises it has to break or my people are gonna be smashed by it. And if it's between the university being a little bit embarrassed and my culture being destroyed, I can rebuild another university. So mahalo.
because, yeah, I'm not sure how that will affect any possibility of hiring. But I'm funny, a good teacher. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully that wins out over, um, and even then, I, ho I would hope that taking care of the university students, even though I'm currently not paid for that position, uh, will assist in future positions, but we shall see. I, being called illiterate was kind of my favorite. Um, I did want to get a whole bunch of our uh, graduates to sit in this hallway, reading quietly, just <laughs> demonstrating <laughs> that we're literate. Uh, I go, it would have been cool too. Um, so like some of us can read multiple languages. So <laughs> um, yeah, so as far as kickback, I, that's been on campus. We do have a Proud Boys uh, movement on campus that's also happening. Um, which is <laughs> right, um, which is interesting. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Um, well, being in like a lot of um, high level math classes, you notice there's not a lot of brown people in there. And, uh, and especially when you're in like physics and you're in any engineering classes, like sometimes you get a, you do get a lot of kickback. I like, if you wear a see you on the mount of t-shirt in the middle of my engineering class, you're gonna stir trouble. Like it's a lot of a lot of, you know, STEM fields, well, particularly in the engineering, physics, and astronomy, you know, which of course the senses were totally not against. I love these kind of fields as well. But like it issues a lot of unwanted debate and debates that escalate really quickly. So, um, for being a Hawaiian and being in the STEM field and being for Mauna Kea, it's like uh, you get a lot of scrutiny uh, a, a lot of ways. So uh, that's what I'm dealing with as a student in Manoa. Yeah. So um, I think towards the beginning of the year, our president does this really funny thing, David Lasner, where he sends out emails um, that talk about recreating safe spaces on campus and being compassionate to each other, um, which really actually translates to everybody watch out for all the crazy Hawaiians on campus who are constantly voicing their opposition to whatever, whatever. Um, yeah, um, a lot of people have screenshotted it, have it as evidence somewhere. And there are also, um, there was one specific email that said, that said be aware, um, it was a call to all admin faculty and staff to be aware for um, protesters or for those who seem like they're trying to instigate um, like some barbaric uh, protest kind of thing. Um, which is blatantly towards any Hawaiians or anyone at all um, on campus um, who have been in support or who have tried to uh, voice their opinion or reach out or just simply educate people like at Campus Center, just very small um, intimate events are, they're afraid of them and they feel threatened and they try to glaze over that by sending an email that says, hey, we should be more compassionate on campus. But um, yeah. I want to add on, I go, I go, that email specifically was really interesting. It was because if you saw a bunch of Hawaiians gathering, I didn't say Hawaiians, um, lock your doors and call, the, and call security. So if you saw people gathering, lock your doors and call security at a university. And then um, that, uh, okay, watch another vocabulary word, pilina. Everybody say pilina. Pilina is kind of like a mix of two words. So pili, which is like a bonding, and then ana. So it's like pili ana is this perpetual binding and unbinding that happens. And um, it's used to kind of translate to relationships. So what is the relationship of a university to its students? and to its students of a certain color, well, I'm not that color, but you know what I mean. DNA says I am. <laughs> and where I am is where I am. But um, that if you see some of them gathering, lock your doors because they can't be trusted, and that you possibly yourself are in danger. 
I think that that's an interesting thing because um, from a Hawaiian perspective, again, my is philosophy that you cannot educate, enlighten, inspire a child unless you love them, unless there's a pilina and there's a respect and there's this mutual, yeah, understanding and love and that creates the best of education. But the university thinks it's no locking, locking them out and locking others in because uh, stopping the conversation seems to be pretty effective right now for them. question um, sure I think mr. Okay, so super interesting. I went to the Hawaiian, uh, Hawaii State Archives and looked into the Attorney General's um, files for Mauna Kea back in 1964, between 1964 and 1973. And in there, I should have just made a whole other PowerPoint, but in there you'll find um, letters between the University of Hawaii and other universities like the University of Arizona and Harvard College, I believe, um, trying to negotiate um, some land exchange so that other universities were also allowed their own um, telescope or observatory on the mountain. So I think from the very beginning of the first telescope that was ever built um, on Hawaii Island, which was actually on Mauna Loa in 1963, I believe, and then Mauna Kea in 1964, um, yeah, it kind of just comes down to the fake state wanting to uh, um, acquire as much land as possible, obviously because they see the value of Mauna Kea being the tallest mountain in the world from sea level, um, but they really don't see the value of the mountain at all. Um, so from the time that the access road was built um, to present day when they're trying to continue to build more observatories, although there are so many of them out of commission already, and to try and tap into like the Mauna Kea aquifer, which has been untapped and is still a pristine water source, it, I think it just goes back to, um, you know, like the extraction of our natural resources that for generations have sustained our island being so small and now with such a growing population, um, we've managed to sustain ourselves for over like thousands of generations. Um, so I guess when you talk about material interest, it's basically the mountain, land, water, um, and yeah, research and the value they see and how much monetary they can how much money they can possibly acquire for all of those very pristine, still intact resources. So in addition to getting, I guess, ownership of resources, yeah, by uh, Lockean concepts of property ownership, we have built it, therefore it is ours. Um, there is a lot of research money that is coming in. Uh, it's billions of dollars, it's over, yeah, something billion dollars in construction. Um, 
uh, improvements. Uh, the TMT Corporation has spread money all over the place. They have actually helped to build the Hawaiian language building at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, there's lots of money, that kind of commerce. And so that's why the research is all like, there's no financial interest. There's no commercial interest. I go, the definition of commerce is money moving. So although it's a nonprofit entity, there's money moving. A researcher gets to travel and gets to publish and gets a position and gets a grant. There's all that money moving. And um, there are different people in the state that um, benefit from that, that movement of money. So um, like a big supporter of the, the building of the telescope is the on oh, the, the, no, the, the better business, what is that? The, no, those they have the community business associations. What is the word? Chamber of, Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii Island is a big supporter and, um, of, of the building because uh, construction workers, um, construction companies try and get their workers to show up to pro TMT rallies because, yeah, um, and try and convince us. I go, in that time, uh, Paul Coleman, when he took me up, uh, he was the only Hawaiian up there. Uh, the building existed since, yeah, the 60s, yeah, the different uh, telescopes. And, and that was in 40 years, they hired one Hawaiian. Um, so <laughs> there's more of us out there. Uh, only one got a job that actually made money. All the rest of us cooked and cleaned and made sure that there weren't no rocks on the road. Um, so, but there's those kinds of financial interests that are cooking. I think the, for the university is, if they do ask to put a pause, um, someone that is an administrator of UH used fake facts and manipulated numbers in such a way that it looked like the university would lose access to possibly a whole bunch of other grants because it would look like um, we negotiated in bad faith on this deal so no other grants would come forth. Um, another scientist, uh, researcher, checked the numbers, found it was false, told the president of the university that the numbers are false. Um, the university still hasn't corrected the story. So the director of research um, or vice president or chancellor of research sent out a thing with um, fake facts um, in the Trumpian American style. And um, Lasner, who is his boss, when we told, when confronted with this, you know, you better tell your employee because he was out of line, he did fake facts. Um, Lasner told us basically, oh yeah, you guys should write a letter. So like, right? The president of the university is asking people with no power to correct of the vice president chancellor guy of research. Um, yeah. And I'm sure if I got the title wrong, it gets me on film. You guys know who I mean. Come ask me later if I know. Mahalo. Um, so I think with um, 
I mean, social media has been huge. So the social media attraction um, of just the Mauna Kea movement um, actually on Hawaii Island has, I think, facilitated um, an avenue for us, Kia Ikahau Kani, the student organized group of UH Manoa, to reach out to other campuses who stand in solidarity with us. Um, just whatever it may be, email or um, a text or FaceTime, you know, anything, any way that we can get in contact with each other. Um, we share organizing strategies. We share um, nonviolent direct action strategies. Um, but I think taking it back just to Hawaii, um, organizing because UH has multiple colleges spread out throughout um, different islands, we, um, we did start to talk to UH Maui, UH Hilo, um, and they have all created their own student organized groups. Um, and we stay in contact um, when we hear a call, when we hear a kahea, or um, we try to support each other by blasting out, you know, different active, different workshops that we're holding. Um, and for international colleges, I think um, right before the Mauna Kea movement kind of blasted off again, a lot of us were in Aotearoa or New Zealand, and we had um, built a lot of very, very, very great relationships there. And um, they have been one of the hugest supports of us, Kiaikahau Kani and the Mauna Kea movement. So um, just knowing somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody and then getting in contact online is how we've tried to stay um, organized cross, cross ocean, cross campus. Um, did I answer to an extent? I don't know if this will answer your question, but um, multiple times at Bachman Hall, we have people from different campuses, uh, from um, from the from the uh, the mainland and actually from international as well, that approach us about their own indigenous struggles. And and personally, for me, the best way that you can understand someone, especially being indigenous, because you know being indigenous is an uphill battle. If I get my engineering degree, it's gonna be a battle, <laughs> but. Like we were, we were approached by the Okinawans about um, about their own Mauna as well, and we also got approached last night about um, uh, uh, forgot it was a, a student from UC Davis who was having um, like uh, doing their own activism for the Philippines about trying to demilitarize from the the United States demilitarize all their some of their bases or most of their bases. And it's like, for me personally, I'm not really good with social media. <laughs> I have these guys to do it for me. But um, it's, I, I love the interconnection between just the person face to face. Then you can truly build bonds. Like even like texting and phone calls is all right, but I, I love the face to face talks. And then you can understand, and then you can piece it together. Like I, I might, this might be construed, but you know, I, I was reading up on this philosopher, his name is like Schopenhauer. And he was doing this thing about like, like I, I kind of did my own like analysis of it. He said that like as pessimistic as it sounds, it says that the world, that the meaning to life of this world is pain. And, uh, but I, I translated that to my own way of saying that the best way that we can understand each other is through sharing pain and that we can truly build bonds with each other, build Polina between each other. And so that it's the act of supporting each other for our own movements. And then in, in the end, we all become Kupa, you know, just one in unity. Cause it, like we're all trying to fight for our humanity. And that's what all indigenous is fighting for, the voices to be heard. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Um, and then as far as outreach to other universities, um, that first week in 2019 up on the Mauna, um, someone got assigned uh, reaching out to other human studies boards at different universities because um, astronomy or the science research that does not, I guess they say directly affect humans. You don't have to go through the IRB human studies process. And so astronomy, because all they're studying is stars, does not have to go through any IRB. 
So I go, I have to go through an IRB because I asked a question that might be a little bit too pointed. I have to redo my question. They can make 80-year-old grandmas get arrested and no problems, that research flies. So I know that there was some sort of, um, someone was assigned uh, to try and hit out to different human studies boards. I think that someone in Toronto or someone from Canada said something um, because I think that that truly is the soft spot because money is money. I go, we can't fight this idea of in a capitalist, globalized world. Um, and I go, uh, when you're uh, asking the question, that, that idea of the resource curse, yeah, if uh, most taxes are paid by the people, then the government tends to act in favor of the people because the people pay more attention to the money and where it goes. But when corporations um, pay the bulk of the taxes, the people go about their day and the government um, uses them up. Um, so I thought about that, that resource curse. Um, and so that's kind of what we're, where we are in Hawaii in that situation is that idea of that resource curse where corporations are paying a bulk of the taxes that fund the government and so people are left ignored. And then if you're the poorest of the people <laughs> that make up that government, you're more likely to be ignored. Um, yeah, as far as health statistics, um, we win for the worst. Um, not only are we the most likely to attempt suicide, we're the most likely to get it done. We're the least likely to graduate from high school, college. I go, this is anomalies that you have right now in front of you. Um, so as far as money and how that moves and the connections, I, that human studies research, I go, no one can say Tuskegee was okay. No one can say Micronesia and studying the fallout is okay. No one can say that an 80 year old grandmother getting arrested for being inconveniently indigenous is okay. No. So, j j just out of curiosity, is that about the um, the administration rules and propos and the resolutions? No, the university admissions. So, who gets into the university? Like, is there a special, like, is there some kind of affirmative action for Hawaiians, or is there what kind of admissions policy, or was there policy? And then UCLA is in something called a first year, first generation, where they're bringing equity and shepherding people to the university. And I wondered if the university has an admissions policy for Hawaiians, if there's a scholarship policy. If the faculty actually um, the thing on campus it seems to be is that University of Hawaii doesn't like to hire its own so that's another part of I'm getting my PhD from the university I'm not sure if I'll get hired because they don't like to hire their own um, the as far as admissions policies it's just that general um, because it's a public university uh, what we do have as Native Hawaiians is if you're a diasporic Hawaiian with genealogical ties to Hawaii, then you can pay residence fee instead of paying out of state. Oh, there's yeah, there's different college opportunities program, but it goes more by grades or yeah, uh, it's not necessarily targeted specifically at Hawaiians. There's different scholarships that different organizations put out that will help Hawaiians pay for school, but um, there's not like an automatic in. Um, there is like a lot of recruitment though. There, uh, the universities do have offices like they work at the Native Hawaiian Student Services uh, that does outreach to the community to recruit students to come in. Um, and each community college campus has a Native Hawaiian Student Center that does that same outreach to get as many in the door as possible. Um, so they do have those things in place. Um, they won't listen to you once you get in, but they'll make, let you in the door. And then make you even a little bit more dangerous. And then the words that you say that, you're, that they're not listening to are a little bit sharper. <laughs> but um, they do have that outreach.
Um, I think for me personally, graduating from um, Kulakaya Puni, it's kind of inherent that you become a teacher um, in the Hawaiian language program, but I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, but after, you know, seeing the extent of the, just the ino, the, how do you even say ino? Um, the ino, the meanness that the state um, puts on kanaka in, in multiple capacities, um, it, it drove me to want to better the education system. So that's why I'm getting my master's in education. Um, I think for a lot of us, a lot of my friends, um, they moved, you know, they, they dropped their lives here. Um, and they move to the Mauna, they're living out of their cars, they're flying back and forth to attend classes or they're taking online classes, you know. Um, it, it forces you to rethink your whole life. Um, I remember, I, I frequented Mauna Kea like a lot this summer and then um, when we had to go back to school, being that it's my first semester in a graduate program and I'm teaching seventh and eighth grade and I have a grad assistant position, like I, I couldn't be there. I couldn't be on the mountain. I couldn't even fly up in, on the weekends if I wanted to just because I was completely overwhelmed and it made me feel extremely guilty that, okay, I'm, I'm doing all of this so that I can become a teacher. You know, th this is my educational path and I don't even want it. I don't even want to be in school. I spent four years in, in my undergrad I have two years in my master's and I don't want it. I, I don't pay for school. I'm, I'm going to school for free, you know, and I don't want to be here. I just want to be on the Mauna. And um, Hiva talked about that a little bit um, of just feeling the Mauna call you and like feeling driven and that you just need to be there for whatever reason, um, for whatever kuleana you have to that genealogical or if you just want to help or you want to be there. I just wanted to be there. And so um, I'm going to be honest, like I contemplated it. I contemplated dropping out of graduate school. I contemplated canceling my GA ship, which pays for my tuition and finding a third job and moving to the Big Island, you know, and doing my student teaching there. I, I it ran through my head all of the possible ways that I could just be there, but still get my degree and teach and have a job. and. Um, over time, it just took me recognizing what my kuleana was, and that was to kind of help in forming this student group, this student hub on um, Manoa, so that we could be that conduit of mana delivery to Mauna Kea. Um, but yeah, a lot of my friends have moved. A lot of my friends have dropped out um, because of it. Um, <clears throat> so. My college career began in 2016. I graduated from KS Hawaii in 2016. And um, 2015, as Kaimi talked about earlier, was when the first um, kind of action was going on. And that was actually the first time my mom got arrested. So my mom got arrested first for Mauna Kea when I was a junior. And from that moment on, it kind of just like pretty much just handed me everything that I wanted to go to college for after that. I was like, you know what? I thought I wanted to go away and play volleyball. I was like, no, I can't do that with all of this going on. My mom just got arrested um, for protecting our sacred mountain. I think I need to let that drive everything I do from here on out. And when I started my um, education at Manoa, I um, went into the political science department and the Hawaiian studies department and um, that's where I hope to graduate from next semester but it's really kind of drew out my entire education and what's happening on Mauna Kea right now I mean Mauna Kea is a space with Pu'uhuluhulu University and all of the classes that they're creating and holding for anyone who just wants to come and listen and learn. Um, it's attracted the knowledgeable and the thirsty. And 
Um, I think what's happening is that we're reclaiming our education and the ways in which we teach in our own um, Hawaiian ways, um, you know, being outdoors and engaging face to face and um, very intimately. Um, and all in all, discovering who we are. And I think that for a lot of people, especially those who have kind of um, tried to balance being on the Mauna and being at the university or just taking their degree to the Mauna or doing everything they can for the Mauna at the university, it's really transcended education itself. And we're regaining a consciousness as we go. And I think um, a lot of people could speak to that as well and how it's shaped um, what we're learning and what we want to give back to our community um, eventually when we acquire whatever pieces of paper we need to do that. Um, so yeah. Sounds good. I think it was, uh, um, okay, let me just get this started. I was actually a music major before I was an engineer. <laughs> like, uh, I, I, I loved it. I wanted to be a sound engineer. I wanted to, I wanted to make music. Um, but uh, as everyone knows, in freshman and sophomore years, sometimes you enjoy college a little too much. <laughs> and, um, you know, and just to make the matter shorter, just to set the stage for it, you know, I, like I, I pretty much got kicked out of UH Chilo for doing really horrible. And then I came back. Like I, I got my associate's degree from um, Hasisi, and then I came back. And I, I, and when I was trying to decide my uh, my degree, I was trying to figure out what would keep me accountable so I never mess up again. So I chose the hardest degree that I could think of. I was being a doctor at first, but I'm I I have a phobia of blood. I faint. So I engineering was next. So setting the groundwork for that. Um, it was just the slowly. Like, oh, I don't, I don't want to. I have a lot of love for Big Island. <laughs> like I like for the community aspect, it's really close. Like you can go to a store, you can see someone that you know. And you know, I walk into UH Manoa, I saw I see a person, I'll never see them again. And it's uh, and it's just like those kind of interconnections between people, and then start slowly getting planted seeds for like different people about Aloha Aina. And what it means to like, like for as a Kanaka and as a, as a person that like, like w the reciprocity between like your land and f and and how you take care of the land, how the land take care of you, and it it really escalated once I got into the pipes internship, like going in. I, I don't know the Hawaiian word for um, Richardson's, but um, there's a local year over there, and um, that. Every you know, I think it's every first Saturday or third Saturday they have like events to help clean the local yield. And I remember going over there, and then there was just something that clicked, and there's something connected. And then once once in like the Mauna happened, then I just knew, for the scientific aspect that I have a duty, to, uh, well, to just like, for a Hawaiian and in science for this Mauna. And then it became more deep in that when, like, it, it became more than that when you found yourself that you have a possibility of being arrested. That it has to come into a more deeper understanding that it's not just science. That there is something that is holding you and that you're willing to sacrifice everything for that kind of, for, for that, to protect for that just issue. And I guess I hope that answer your question about that. Okay. For me, I think, like, seeing at Bachman Hall, um, there's all this word sit-in, occupation. Those are all words of other struggles. Um, instead, what I see is they created this kipuka, this healing space for students that their heart and their bodies and their families, their blood calls to them to be in a certain place, but their kuleana to the future and in the long game means that they have to get a degree first or they have to stay here first. So instead of seeing it as an occupation or a sit-in, it's a space where these students, some of them who are freshly woke, like from some like just fresh from the continent that are reconnecting to the indigeneity um, that they were born with but were diasporically separated from. So that 
idea of the kipuka is created there. Personally, from my research, got blown up because I was supposed to discuss Hiaka Ikopoli Opele with uh, people, or oh, the part about Panaeva with people from Halao Kikuhi that is running the ceremonies. So my research got put on pause because of what's happening on Mauna Kea specifically. Um, at the same time, I have a kuleana to this space and finishing my degree. So my degree is actually in philosophy, but indigenous philosophy specifically and indigenous educational philosophy, because there are a lot of organizations, including Kamehameha schools, the DOE, the university, claiming these Hawaiian places of learning by putting pineapple on pizza, not knowing what Hawaii ever was. And so that is what my research is, is to actually, because my theory is this cultural education without being grounded in that culture is educational blackface. Yeah, it's like this horrible show of cellophane skirts and pineapples um, of a hukilau mathematics. And I go, I'm not about it. And it was partly inspired by Mauna Kea because there's this disconnect and this disrespect of indigenous ways of knowing. I, we've lived here for a thousand years. When I chant the mountain, it's because I've watched it for a thousand years, not in my eyes, but in my kupuna's eyes and in their kupuna's eyes. And to have a respect for a thousand years of data. And I, and I think that needs to be brought into the academy like this. And now say, come at me, TNT. Well, yeah. All right. Mahalo nui loa e na haumana Hawaii e na poe aloha aina. Mahalo nui ya oko na kukui ana. Let's give our panelists another huge round of applause. Uh, thank you so much for speaking and sharing your perspectives. And thank you for joining us today. Okay. Aloha aina. Thank you.